When human rights gained recognition, the dominant power was the state relative to the individual and citizen. Now, transnational businesses have vastly greater power than both. That's a central message headlined by Harris Gleckman in an op-ed published November 4th called Counterbalancing Disproportionate Power, a response to John Ruggie. The author, Harris Gleckman, is a senior fellow at the Center for Governance and Sustainability at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. John Ruggie is a professor in human rights and international affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. The topic of Harris Gleckman's response to Ruggie relates to negotiations concerning the fourth session of a UN Human Rights Council Intergovernmental Working Group on Transnational Corporations and Human Rights. The mandate for these negotiations came into effect in 2014, when the Human Rights Council adopted Resolution 26-9, by which it decided, quote, to establish an open-ended intergovernmental working group on transnational corporations and other business enterprises with respect to human rights, whose mandate shall be to elaborate an international, legally binding instrument to regulate in international human rights law the activities of transnational corporations and other business enterprises. This fourth session of the open-ended intergovernmental working group took place in October at the UN Geneva. During that session, the working group discussed a draft text of a treaty known as the Zero Draft, prepared as a basis for negotiation for that legally binding instrument. Gleckman's response to Ruggie has to do with arguments Ruggie made in opposition to that binding treaty under negotiation. Gleckman says Ruggie's arguments are misdirected and fail to recognize the historic opportunity offered by the Human Rights Council to create a human rights remedy system for corporate abuse across national boundaries. Gleckman covers a lot of ground in his response to Ruggie. In this brief, we narrow focus to one of the preliminary observation Gleckman made about the framework of the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights. The UN Guiding Principles is a principle-based, or in other words, a voluntary-based system of corporate governance and was authored by John Ruggie. There are three pillars in the framework of the UN Guiding Principles, protect, respect, and remedy. With respect to the third pillar, the need for access to remedy, Gleckman's op-ed states, no major democratic country deals with domestic civil or criminal matters related to human rights based fundamentally on a voluntary system. Given this legal history alone, it makes good sense to have a clear set of binding rules and procedures for a more complex cross-border remedy system. It's also clear from the facts on the ground that there's not now a working global remedy system for those whose human rights have been violated by business with a transnational character. It's also clear from the political decision of the Human Rights Council to create the working group that a significant number of governments share this view. This should not be surprising. If a business can use jurisdictional boundaries to avoid providing documents that may provide evidence of corporate human rights violations, then that business will certainly do so. If a witness can avoid providing evidence that the international partner instructed the local firm to take an action that resulted in a human rights violation, then that witness may be quite happy to stay out of court. If a court ruled against an international business in either a civil or criminal case, would that international business voluntarily pay a fine of millions of dollars or accept that its executives are financially or criminally sanctioned? A voluntary-based remedy system cannot reasonably result in a meaningful remedy system, particularly if the issues are contested between the parties and the potential financial costs are significant. Consequently, a well-drafted remedy system and a binding treaty could well be the only way the third pillar of the UN guiding principles could be meaningfully implemented. In wrapping up on his differences with Ruggie, Gleckman states, to be clear, my underlying difference with Ruggie and other supporters of the UN guiding principles who disparage the complementary nature of a binding treaty is that times have changed. The times have changed was, of course, the key message cited at the open of this report. 
that when human rights gained recognition, the dominant power was the state relative to the individual and citizen. Now, transnational businesses have vastly greater power than both. Gleckman states, therefore it's wise to combine the power and authority of states, individuals, and community associations to establish clear and effective standards, rules, and procedures to counterbalance those which have disproportionate power today. Gleckman's point that Ruggie has failed to recognize the historic opportunity offered by the Human Rights Council to create a human rights remedy system for corporate abuse across national boundaries puts the 2014 UN Human Rights Council Resolution 269 and its open-ended intergovernmental working group and subsequent working sessions into their proper historic context. As documented by the Treaty Alliance, since the early 1970s, there have been concerted efforts to develop a binding international system to hold transnational corporations and other business enterprises accountable for human rights violations and abuses. Within the United Nations system, these efforts have been consistently blocked. That's why, into the present, the United Nations only endorses the Global Compact and the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. In other words, a voluntary system of corporate self-regulation based on principles for guiding a corporate code of conduct. In 2014, the adoption of UN Human Rights Council Resolution 269 put the need for a binding code of conduct back onto the table at the United Nations. This is what Harris Gleckman recognizes as the historic opportunity offered by the Human Rights Council to create a human rights remedy system for corporate abuse across national boundaries, as do the testimonials of countless communities, workers, and survivors of transnational corporate human rights violations and abuses over decades. The work of this intergovernmental working group mandated to elaborate this international legally binding instrument goes on, as does the decades-long struggle of countless communities and workers to defend their human rights against corporate abuse across national boundaries.